Greetings, welcome back to Black Bear News where we are discussing climate change, abrupt climate change, uh, possible biosphere collapse, destruction of an ecosystem. And uh, I'm going to start the, this video off with a few comments, really good comments. Thank you uh, once again, everybody, for your amazing participation in this channel. And thank you so much for your amazing donations. Um, it really, really helps me to continue this endeavor. <clears throat> um, starting off with a comment from uh, uh, Zibinek Zibin Smetana. And I'm totally just munching that. I'm sorry. Uh, Zbinek. Zbinek. Kevin, loved your video as always. Your intro comments about negative naysayers brought me to think about an issue often sidestepped by many commentators on the abrupt climate change. I have two teenage sons and a wife. They don't want to hear any more of the doom and gloom. My friends basically told me to stop reminding them that the future is over. Most of it is prompted by, what can I do? Um, and I. Somebody just commented, what can we do? Strangely, I'm getting to that point. COP24 is meeting and French yellow vests just forced the government to stop for at least a half a year. A new carbon tax on car fuel. That tax did not double, triple, or quadruple the gas price. French gas prices increased overall by 23% since 2000. BBC article, the new tax was seven and three cents per liter oil gas respectively, a laughable amount if we want to even pretend to do something about climate. In Australia, uh, uh, Julia G uh, Gillard introduced carbon, carbon tax. First, she was ousted by her own party from the prime minister post, and then her party lost next, the next round of national elections on a single promise to repeal the carbon tax, which Abbott did. We all would like for everything to be okay with climate, but no one, 99%, is willing to give up TV, phones, cars, air conditioning, airplanes, hot water, electricity, foods, food and goods from around the globe, et cetera, et cetera. Most people cannot be bothered to bring their own bags to shop, to recycle, to stop drinking from plastic. For all the talk, there is no real willingness to give up our comforts for some elusive common good. It is not that people don't care. It is too abstract uh, compared to the instant, instant gratification <clears throat> that our life became. Governments are not helping, actually. I came to believe that claiming stupidity and not talking about how completely dire is the situation is a form of crowd control to prevent riots and civil unrest, large-scale suicides and despair, people stopping to go to work, you name it. Collapse of all order. So we pretend that everything is under control. Governments are meeting to pretend that they're doing something in the fairy tale of normalcy, growth, happy tomorrows, economic prosperity, etc. Anyway, Back to my starting point, how do you deal with the tsunami of shit on the horizon and your kids? They are the ones who will potentially bear the brunt of it all. On one hand, I need them to know to be ready. On the other hand, I want them to have a happy childhood, to have some nice memories as the world turns to shit. Pardon my language. Anyway, thanks for the video. They, videos. They help. I don't feel as isolated. <clears throat> um, thank you, Zbinek. Zbinek. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, excellent comment. I really enjoyed that. Um, it is hard. It's a judgment call. Um, you know, you, you feel the obligation to tell everybody what the deal is. And if you tell them um, on, on, on some level, you're, you're uh, initiating um, some kind of mental despair and, uh, you know, possibly, you know, I mean, it's, it's definitely some information that's going to change someone's life. So it's very difficult to, to uh, broach that subject, especially with children. Um, I mean, you kind of have to just live your life and you also have to tell the truth. So you kind of do it as well as you can, as delicately as you can. And um as caring as you can, if, if you can, you know, um, I don't think going around bludgeoning people with the, with the truth is, you know, necessarily um, constructive. Um, but the truth is out there for people to find, you know, at, a la this channel. So that's why we're here. We're here to present the truth. And um, 
it's probably upsetting a lot of people, I'm sure. <laughs> if you run across the channel and you're not ready or you're not um, really into thinking about it, then you're just not going to want to think about it. So there you go. Next comment from Gigabane. Chatting away about it on Facebook and YouTube is not a waste of time. This is the biggest threat to humanity we have ever faced, and there are aspects about our own way of living that actively subvert, subvert the truth. Talking amongst ourselves deals uh, with people, people's need to reach out to the larger community. Sure, there are all sorts of contributions, but at the end of the day, some of us are clued up and believe, and some of them pump out ideas and ask lots of questions. Can we save ourselves from mass extinction? I doubt it. But if enough of us learn the right things, permaculture, primitive fortifications and weapons, pikes, arrows, bolts, ballista, spikes, defenses using height and terrain, solar and wind, greenhouse manufacture, and so on, <clears throat> and we learn about the best places to make a stand, highlands and places far above sea, partly to defend your food, partly, for, partly to plan for rising seas and temps and storms, Hopefully enough of us can coordinate to form end of the world villages where we can dig in hard, grow and sustain as much diversity as we can protect and wait out the food shocks that will take most. If we make it that far, we have some time on our own supply lines to establish contact with each other and go out collecting any tech that can help us defend from and mitigate climate woes whilst slowly riding out the storm and figuring out ne the next big steps. We need this, this information lines to stay open to the very end. You are important. Thank you, Gigabane. <clears throat> yeah, I know I said yesterday that, you know, um, what is the value possibly of talking about this on YouTube? There, there is value. I mean, the main reason I started this channel was as a form of therapy and as a form of just, just discussion and just to add another voice. Um, I think people relate to different voices, different attitudes, different viewpoints. Um, so as many people as possible uh, that can be talking about this um, public, publicly and having, you know, intelligent discussions about, you know, what's going on, what to do, what can't we do, what, you know, what should we do, et cetera, et cetera. I think all of that is, um, all of that is positive. So <clears throat> I'm going to dig into whatever article, articles I can dig into on this video and probably come back with another one. So, yeah let's talk about geoengineering and <laughs> let's talk about uh, actual factual geoengineering that is um, being planned or going on right now. So I did talk yesterday a little bit about China manufacturing rain and here's an article about it and this is from April 11th 2018 popular science. Uh, China is using furnaces to manufacture 10 billion tons of rain in an effort to solve some of the country's Water shortage problems, China is building tens of thousands of chemical rainmakers. The goal, manufacture 10 billion tons of rainfall on the Tibetan Plateau. The silver iodide furnaces developed by the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or CASC, will be placed on Himalayan mountains at altitudes above 16,400 feet. These cloud seeders encourage puffs of vapor coming from the Indian Ocean to produce rain, something they don't do on their own given the geography of the northern part of the Tibetan Plateau and the Kidam Basin. Those northern areas fall into a rain shadow. Low altitude clouds are blocked by the southern part of the Himalayas. But how does it all work? To induce rainfall, the furnaces burn chemical fuel to produce smoke laced with silver iodide. When that silver iodide rises and mixes with clouds, it crystallizes, setting off chain reaction that precipitates well precipitation. To increase efficiency, the rainmakers will be plugged into a computer network that uses weather satellites to time the release of silver iodide during the periods of cloud coverage. All right, so I'm going to link this below. Just, you know, they have already been doing, they are, are already doing this as they have already been doing this. Uh, China is famous for manip manipulating the weather um, and also, you know, manipulating their um, their smog and their pollution in order to look good. You know, when the cameras are on, they turn all the factories off uh, and everything clears up right away. I heard somebody, some uh, guys the other day talking about traveling to China and how bad the pollution was. And one guy was saying that, you know, they had something going on, I don't know, some festival or holiday or whatever. And they, they basically shut down all the factories and the, uh, the sky instantly cleared, the air instantly cleared up within a day, and it was beautiful. Um, 
but obviously shutting down all those factories has other um, other consequences to the people working there um, and to the economy. So moving on to this next geoengineering article, first ever sun dimming experiment will mimic volcanic eruption and attempt to reverse global warming. This is from the Independent, and this is from 10 hours ago. <clears throat> If solar geoengineering is as good as what is shown in these models, it would be crazy not to take it seriously. Scientists plan to mimic the, mimic the effects of massive volcanic eruption uh, in a bid to tackle global, global warming. Plans to geoengineer the atmosphere by blocking out sunlight have been floated before, but an experiment launched next year um, by Harvard, Harvard researchers will be the first to test the theory in the stratosphere. Here it comes. The team will be will use a balloon suspended 12 miles above the Earth to spray tiny chalk particles across a kilometer long area with the intention of reflecting the sun's rays away from the planet. In doing so, they will attempt to replicate on a small scale the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. During this event, the volcano, volcano spewed 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, creating a haze that cooled the planet by uh, 0.5 C for around 18 months, returning the Earth to its pre-industrial temperature. The science, scientists argue that replicating this effect on a large scale could provide the planet with respite from global warming, stopping the sea ice from melting and protecting coral from bleaching. As efforts to tackle climate change appear ever more desperate, geoengineering has emerged as an increasingly appealing prospect, albeit controversial one, that has drawn criticism from scientists and environmentalists. Some have suggested that solar geoengineering could have profound complications, for example, wiping out crops, while others argue it distracts attention from cutting fossil fuel emissions, of course. However, team members and experimental physicist, team member and experimental physicist Professor David Keith said their analysis suggests ultimately the benefits of such attempts may well outweigh the negative impacts. Um, chew on that for a while. And who knows? Who knows what kind of, I mean, they're absolutely gonna do it and who knows what, what kind of consequences that is going to bring us. Um, could it give us a brief, you know, some brief relief um, from the warming? Probably, will it stop? Will it, will it stop the weather events? Is it gonna stop? the melting of the ice? Is it gonna stop the coral bleaching? Is it gonna stop the uptake of CO2? That's um, key right there. Um, you know, the uptake of CO2 from the oceans, the, you know, the releasing of CO2 to from forests, the, the releasing of CO2 from cars and factories and ships and planes. Um, it could just add a whole, you know, just a whole other, um, bad element to the mix, who knows? Um, but, you know, strap on your boots because it's happening. Um, that's all I have for you in this video. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Until next time, peace.